Force reload this page. Invisible visualization. HTML content. Invisible visualization. Creating accessible information graphics. Doug Sheepers, W3C. Link, at Shapazu. Screen reader experience, HTML content. Screen reader. Interact with, screen reader experience, HTML content. Interact with text, this is how the web sounds. Heading level 1, this is how the web sounds. Imagine your entire experience of the web is through a screen reader. You're reading an article, and you're very interested in the topic. Then the author decides a picture is worth a thousand words, and they provide a useful chart or diagram. A chart showing the relative understandability of a chart by different audiences' image. The article then proceeds to draw conclusions based on the graphic. Left double quotation mark. As you see, not all audiences are able to process information graphics with the same degree of success. Right double quotation mark. But you don't see, because you couldn't see the graphic, and the author didn't describe it adequately in the alt text. Hey, at least this author was thoughtful enough to provide alt text, many authors don't even do that. You see the problem. Now, show of hands, how many of you want me to do this whole presentation using a screen reader? <laughs> Sadists. <laughs> Oh. Hi, everyone. So, who here has used a screen reader before? Excellent. Who here has heard a screen reader before? Before this. <laughs> so, um, using a screen reader is not what I would call the, the richest experience of the web that you can encounter. Um, and it's frustrated by uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hurdles that I think can be easily overcome. And one of the more interesting things that I, uh, that I find is we think of visualizations as being visual, but they don't have to be exclusively visual. And hopefully, I can show you a few things that change how you might think about your visualizations. Ooh, I spoke too soon. I'm going to have to change, put my screen reader back on. Sorry. So this is actually, uh, it's really great to have a screen reader. Uh, Welcome to VoiceOver. Yes, 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 yes. Welcome back. Oh, Welcome sorry. Back sorry. Cool. Who here is on a Mac? No, we, SVG works in test. We're You've got a screen reader right there. HTML content. Space with Chrome containing window SVG works in test. Full screen space. You've got a screen reader right there in your, in your computer. Uh, if you More don't have... I, I know. Shut, 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 just... I'm talking here. <laughs> You've got a screen reader right there on your computer. It's trivial for you to test things. Um, so uh, one of the nice things about, I'm not going to do this whole presentation using a screen reader uh, because I love myself too much. But uh, there is an interesting feature of SVG, and that is that SVG has text. SVG is a text format. This section in the dotted line is inline SVG. Does anyone not know what inline SVG is? Does anyone not know what inline SVG is? Okay, inline SVG is SVG is a document format. Uh, you can use SVG. Uh, as a standalone document format, so it, it, that's all that's p appearing in the browser. Uh, inline SVG is, is SVG in which the content of the SVG is directly embedded in HTML. That's, uh, by contrast, uh, you, there's uh, SVG by reference in which, got, in which you've got an external SVG Im image and you're referencing it in an image element, an object, an iframe, something like that to bring it into HTML or just viewing it as the root element. So, Inline SVG, if you're using D3, which I assume 120% of you are, uh, you're using inline SVG. Text 
Text in SVG is readable in a screen reader. Even if it's on text though. Text in SVG. Oh, they changed the screen reader. It used to read out the titles. You are currently on text reader. It's under HTML content. This whole presentation may be broken. Screen reader experience HTML content. Wow, I might have to talk to Apple. Okay, just a second. Interact with the timer button. Interact with the timer button. No. Interact with the timer button. Screen reader experience HTML content. Yes. Interact with interact with A. C. Access of SV chart. Wow. So SVG is no longer accessible. <laughs> um, this is embarrassing. I tested this a couple weeks ago when this worked, and there must have been some change to voiceover, and it no longer works. Could have been oh, it could have been a Chrome update. Let me try it in Firefox. Just a second. If this doesn't work, I, I'll give you all your money back <laughs> for this. Just, just this talk. Thank you, thank you. I did nothing. I did nothing. Thank you. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so embarrassed. I was about to show you how. I was going to show you how amazing SVG accessibility is. And uh, I believe voiceover has changed. So I'm going to give you the talk anyway. <laughs> And the principles remain the, the same, and we will get this fixed. But for now, this is not the version of this talk that I want you to watch. I want you to go back on YouTube and watch another version of this talk. So the basic idea is, it remains the same, regardless of whether or not it works. Um, so uh, if we can just. Excuse me for just one moment. I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead and remove the screen reader because it can only get in the way now. Uh, so I'll have a little chat with the folks at Apple. Anybody from Apple here? Okay, so the idea of SVG is that text is text. And in addition to text being text, metadata is also text. So here you have a bar chart in SVG. And uh, you have a little bit of text here. This is this bit over here that says, you know, hours work spent working on this presentation. Um, if you don't know SVG, it's not that hard to learn. Here's the key bit that I included in this, uh, in the SVG to make it ostensibly uh, accessible. For each bar, for each section that you know, represents a piece of data, I just included that piece of data as a title to the element. This doesn't show up visually unless you, unless you mouse over it. When you mouse over it, 
you get a little tool tip. But normally, and Lynn, you can attest to this, you've seen this working. Normally what it does is when it encounters inline SVG, it, walk, it hits the title and it reads out the title. And so a screen reader should read out the title for each element. This is not perfect, this is not ideal, but it is some way of making a data visualization accessible to somebody who cannot see it. Um, next year at Graphical Web, I will have this working. <laughs> so you'll all have to come. Uh, so, uh, there's another aspect to why you should add data to your charts beyond accessibility, data portability. If I make a bar chart uh, um, and I want, and I send it to my colleague and I include the data in there, they can extract that data to make a line chart, to make any other kind of thing. They can make a correction to that based on the data that's there in the chart. If I, do, if I send them a PNG or a JPEG and I don't send them an additional text file that, you know, with, with the data, they can't do anything with that. Uh, it also makes it more searchable. If somebody's looking for your image and they're looking for certain keywords, if you are using SVG and you have a static version of SVG and you have that, uh, those keywords in there, it's going to be more searchable. Uh, it's going to be more findable. You can extract the data, you can remix it. So uh, SVG has gotten to be very popular because of retina. Um, and uh, the, the idea behind this is that it is, in, in fact, infinitely zoomable. Uh, and that's what I'm going to show you an example of how that comes into accessibility uh, later on. One thing about uh, accessibility is when people think of accessibility, they think of blind people. But that's not the only kind, and it's maybe not even the primary kind of, of accessibility you need to be thinking about. There are people with cognitive disabilities, like all of us when we're sleepy or up on stage. Um, and speaking of being up on stage, there's something called the pictorial superiority effect. 75% um, of your sensoria, uh, of, the, of your brain uh, your processing dedicated to your sensoria is for your vision. Everything else. Uh, tactile, audio, uh, taste, smell, is just 25%. So that means our brain it really is tuned to see things. And one example of the pictorial superiority effect is that memory retention of three days, if you give a presentation, for example, where you have a visual element, memory retention after three days uh, if you do not have a presentation, if you do not have visuals to go along with your points, is about 10%. If you include images that reinforce your thoughts, uh, 60%. So it says right there how geared we are towards realizing uh, information through visualization. And this is not just uh, for people without cognitive disabilities, it's also for people with cognitive disabilities. So by helping out everybody, you're also helping out people who need, to under, need a different way of understanding data. Uh, this effect actually increases with age. Uh, little kids do not process visually nearly as much as adults do. Uh, and as you get older, the effect increases even further. You can actually read a lot more about this in a book called Brain Rules by John Medina. Um, so, I'm going to test, give you a little bit of, uh, of a test here. Uh, I'm going to ask you to look at uh, some different presentations of data uh, about a board game I played with some friends. And I want you to, uh, basically, it's a game is small world. Small world fans out there? One. Just one. Okay. Uh, me, my wife, our friend Jerry. Uh, the game lasts 10 rounds, and each round we scored 3 to 13 points. And I'm going to flash two different representations of the scoring on, this, on the screen. And I want you uh, to, privately to yourselves, figure out who won the game. So I'm going to give you 
uh, three seconds for each one. Okay, who's confident that they know who won the game? Okay, we could try the second visualization. Now who's confident? Right? And what, what was going on there is I didn't do anything special with the data. I just, it's the same data as in this chart, but I made it visual and immediately you could uh, process more quickly what was going on there. Process more easily what was going on there. So uh, data visualization, rather than being a challenge to accessibility, actually is an aid to accessibility. It aids in apprehension and comprehension. Um, and it's really important for you to get, uh, uh, to understand something quickly, especially when you're making decisions. Here, Jerry, uh, Jerry, I was doing really well at the very beginning of the game. Uh, and Jerry said, oh, Doug's scoring lots of points. Let's, let's pick on him. And so he, he fought me the entire game. Meanwhile, my wife, who was a very sneaky player, was consistently scoring smaller scores than I was. You can see she was scoring smaller scores than I was, but consistently doing better. And so he processed the information in a way that led to him to the wrong conclusion and led me to lose the game, which makes me very upset. <laughs> so the speed of understanding is important, but also picking the information that you're, that you're choosing to show someone is also, giving them the correct information is even more important to decision making. So there are several learning modes uh, that the human brain has. Um, visual, auditory, tactile, and reading and writing. If you, have, if you use any one of these learning modes by itself, um, it's, it's effective, but if you combine two of them, there's an exponential increase in how quickly and how uh, long you can retain the information. Um, and also, if you have an emotional aspect to it, if you touch people emotionally, that actually uh, increases it still further, how, how well somebody will retain the information that you're using. And this is why uh, making people laugh, making people cry, making people love your visualization is actually an aid to accessibility. It's an aid to people processing uh, and understanding your information. So, it, so aesthetics, beauty, is actually an accessibility requirement. We have a visual bias. Um, oops, I screwed up. So which of these is more, which, which of these segments is the largest one? Anybody? Which one? Red. Yes, red. But actually by a considerable margin. And uh, yellow, a lot of people think yellow is actually, that's because yellow is really bright. And yellow distracts people into, it draws the eye, it makes it seem larger. So when you're using palettes, and I'll talk a little bit about colors, um, you need to, the, the first lesson is, Choose your colors carefully. Uh, bright colors make a stronger pressure. The second lesson is that pie charts suck. Um, but we all knew that. Um, so, uh, and actually, you'll see, I think there's like four or five pie charts in this presentation. They're good for really gross, large uh, 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 comparisons, not for fine degrees. Uh, so, we think that we've come to data visualization and we just understand it, right? Oh, you see a visualization, you see a bar chart, you just understand it. It's, it's not, there's nothing special there, but actually it's not intuitive. It's not, uh, it's not something we're, that's built into us. There's a visual vocabulary, the vocabulary that we're using. We learn this. We learn that a rectangle that's this big and a rectangle that this, that's this big have a relationship to one another and that this one means more. And this is not something that, we've lost that. It's like we can't look at a word and not understand uh, that, that, what that word is in a language that we understand. We can't look at a word and not understand that word in the same way now we, we look at a visualization and we, don't, we can't not understand it. But it is something that we have to learn. And I'm gonna to touch on that in a little bit. 
So complexity. Somebody said earlier in this present, earlier in this uh, conference, they said, if you're making somebody, I mean, complexity can be beautiful, right? Um, but complexity can also be complex. Um, if you're making somebody really work and understand your visualization, you're, you're doing it wrong. And this is actually a really huge problem for accessibility. You need to be elegant in your, in, in your, uh, in your, accessible, in your accessible information graphics, not only because, let's assume that my bar chart thing example worked earlier. Try to imagine navigating this, understanding this thing uh, while you're using a screen reader. And then just back off that a little bit and try to imagine understanding this when you're looking at it. Um, <laughs> this, is not, this is not useful. Um, think of your, uh, your visualizations as more of a poem and not as a novel. Be sparing in what you do so that you can uh, make it more accessible to the widest degree, of, to the widest audience. So, uh, I said that accessibility isn't all about blind people, but it is partly about blind people. Um, here, SVG is infinitely zoomable, right? But if I zoom in on this, uh, this doesn't mean anything, right? So um, a lot of you actually all already have this problem when you're trying to look at graphics in this way. Um, blind people aren't the only ones who use magnifiers. Uh, we all have this limited viewport that we're trying to do. When you're making an accessible visualization, when you're making a visualization, think about what it's going to look like when it's viewed uh, in a small area without much context. Uh, so keep that context in with your visualization. Make sure that it's uh, uh, adaptable. Make sure that it's responsive, to use a keyword there, a buzzword. Speaking of responsive, mm. you probably already know this, but SVG actually has the ability to be responsive using media queries. So here's an HTML5 logo. I make it a little bit smaller, and boom, the HTML word disappears um, because I don't need it at this size. I zoom it even further, and I'll show you that transition again. Uh, it gets rid of that, the extra color in the background. It increases the size of the five, and it gets rid of all the gradations. It just turns it into a solid white, and it brightens it up a little bit for a smaller version. And this is trivial to do. It's just media queries. Same image, all just the same file, just at different resolutions, at different file sizes. And you can do this by embedding. You can have a, uh, you can have an HTML5, in, uh, or you can have a, an SVG graphic. You're referencing it three times in the same page, and you can have it be the same. You can have it adapt to the size of the viewport that you're using. So if you embed it as an image at this size versus this size, they're going to be different. Um, I'm going to skip this one, but it's XKCD. So I think it's obligatory XKCD uh, reference. Uh, colors. Um, who? Actually, Lynn, was that? Did I steal this from you? This was at the Open VizConf the, the first year. Um, <laughs> Uh, colors are actually really important uh, for accessibility. Uh, who here is familiar with the Brewer palette? Who, ha who has used D3, D D3's color palette? Okay, well, it's the same thing. Um, uh, a woman named Cynthia Brewer uh, came up with this for mapping. Uh, there's three different values. There's discrete, sequential, and diverging. Discrete is when you want to indicate that things are not of the same category. They're different categorical things. Uh, sequential is when you want to show that things are in a sequence. And diverging is when you want to show the gradations of the sequence. Um, so you've got the quantitative, the qualitative, and the bipolar, uh, which is very depressing <laughs> kind of category. Anyway, um, so she used this for maps. And so here's an example of uh, uh, the Brewer palette applied to a map. Um, and the reason that it's good is because it has because they are of the same tone, 
uh, they aren't likely to be confused by people with um, color blindness. Uh, they, um, uh, they don't distract visually from one another. They, they're all equivalent. And, uh, and these palette, this palette gives you a really wide variety of, of colors. So um, another nice thing about colors in SVG is that you can have alternate fills. For example, um, when I talked about making a beautiful visualization, this is exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> um, I'm not just colorblind, I'm also aesthetic blind. So, um, so uh, another interesting thing about patterns is tactily, um, you can actually make, uh, using patterns, you can make tactile maps. I wish I had remembered to bring it, but I did not. Uh, at the first SVG open I attended, somebody showed a map, and I got a copy of that map. It's printed on something called swell paper. Uh, imagine you, uh, you, the darker the black that's printed on the paper, they put it under a heat lamp. This paper swells up. The black absorbs the heat. It raises higher. So as they run their fingers over this, they could feel, oh, this is a, and uh, they would run their fingers over this and they'd say, oh, this is a highway. There would be a little sound of a highway. There's some traffic noises. They'd run their fingers over the water. Ah, this is water. Boop, 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 boop. Um, and, they, and they'd put it basically over a tablet-like surface and they'd, they'd move around it and they'd, uh, they could understand the map. And another feature of this is that you can actually print with Braille fonts, um, as, as, I, as you can see here. You, that's print with Braille fonts in Braille. Uh, this is actually really, this is another part of the sensorium that we can engage that we don't really think about with SVG. In, in fact, some people are using SVG for 3D printing. Uh, that's not necessarily a, a typical data visualization thing, but that's something to think about if you're trying to reach that audience. Um, interactivity. Um, this is another consideration for accessibility. Um, there's a lot of navigation challenges, as you can imagine. Um, there's a lot of people who the only way that they can interact with a web page is by sucking or blowing through a pipe. That's, that's their interaction. I mean, think Stephen Hawking, effectively, right? Only not as wealthy and famous as Stephen Hawking. Um, so then you've, obviously, you've got your visual impairments. Um, when you are dynamically using your content, there's something called ARIA, and you can tell people that um, are blind, that wouldn't see this thing that's m changing over in the corner, you can tell them, this is an ARIA live region, and it will tell them, hey, every time it's updated, it will tell them. Uh, when you are navigating by the keyboard, you, wanna, you often want to use things like tab index. When you're making the document, think about the order in which that document is being uh, consumed. Think about the document order and grouping, not just how it looks. So, uh, Oh, let's see. This might work with the screen reader. How much time do I have? Not much. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, but you can make it uh, Canvas accessible. Uh, who here has, uh, who can tell me what the difference between these two buttons is? No? Anybody? Obvious, pretty obvious. No. <laughs> this one is not a button because it doesn't have ARIA markup on it. Uh, we are, um, ARIA is a way of adding attributes to, uh, a, a, um, to an element to basically tell it what its role is. Here, uh, I, I'm also styling them with ARIA. So if I press this, if this works, yes. When I, when I change the state to pressed, the CSS, I have the style says, if it's pressed, change the color. Um, this also works directly with accessibility APIs of the platform, and it tells them that even though this isn't actually a button, I've told it that it's a button. It's like using a div. Um, again, th there's more ARIA things. I'm going to skip on to auditory. Um, so who can tell me what this is? Right, but what is this data representing? Look at the dates. Recession. Yeah, this is, this is the recession. Um, and I'm going to show you 
So when you look at this, you can just look at the trend and you see the gist. You're like, oh, <coughs> kind of goes up, and then boom, goes down really far, goes back up more slowly. How can a blind person get the gist of a chart, right? Not just reading out the data values. How can they understand just the gist of it? Well, like this. So I went over that too quickly and, and too slowly. Uh, but the point is, this is something called sonification. And uh, this is done using SVG and the Web Audio API. And it's a library that you can download and help me improve. Um, and basically, you apply this to an SVG line chart. And it will sonify that line chart. Uh, and you can, this is all web technology. This is something you can do today. Um, the final sense I want to talk about is the olfactory sense. Um, there are spray, there are scratch and sniff inks that you can use. That no, there are, there are, but I'm not really serious about that. Um, uh, so what's going on in the future? One of the things that's going on in the future for SVG and accessibility is I told you about all those different chart types that we have. Uh, we want to categorize those and create an aria of vocabulary that basically makes those available to, to screen readers so that you can do things more than just read out a set of values. You can also um, uh, jump around within the values. If we look at a bar chart, for example, you know, our eye is immediately drawn to the OECD average. This is uh, uh, public spending on early learning as percentage of GDP. You can see how immediately we're like, oh, my eye is drawn to that, and my eye is drawn to that. So what if we marked those as being special somehow in, uh, in the markup and said, these are the two? And then what if I wanted to say, OK, United States, well, I want to compare that to, uh, I don't know, Denmark. Well, if, if, the, if we set this up as a graph, as it were, we could let somebody with a screen reader say, OK, United States, I know the value for the United States. Now jump me over to Denmark and compare them, and it might say you know, twice as much or whatever it is. Um, and it could, you could, we visually do this. We hop around. We, we pick up the things that are interesting to us. And we, our eyes, the saccade, we, our eyes go back and forth trying to find the things that we're interested in, compare them. And we want to add the same capability to people who use screen readers. And we can do that by uh, letting people easily mark up their, uh, their visualizations. Uh, Tav already mentioned connectors. These are things like uh, graphs, networks, org charts, flow charts, family trees, schematics, social networks, uh, subway maps. These are all things that can be uh, described by saying, I have a node, I have a connection, and what the nature of the connection is. And we're going to try to add those to SVG. Uh, so lastly, webplatform.org is a site that uh, is Help run by W3C and a bunch of our members. And we hope that you guys contrib can contribute to webplatform.org. It's a place for people to learn how to use uh, web technologies. Uh, and we hope that you can uh, visit and learn, help us Im uh, improve the SVG section. That would be really wonderful. Um, and finally, w so about a quarter of the world now uses the web. W3C community is about 32,000 people. That's all our mailing list subscribers. We have 1,500 working group participants, about 400 member organizations, and, and 70 staff. That's broken up into, you know, we're mostly technical. Even the management people are mostly technical, the IT people. We're mostly technical people. But um, you guys outnumber us. Uh, and we'd really like you to participate in the process. And there's going to be a panel later on about that, uh, about how you can participate and how you can try to affect change within standards and within the web platform. And finally, I'll just plug W3C. We've been around for 20, 20 years. The web has been around for 25 this year. Um, and we're having a symposium in the, uh, in the fall in, uh, in Santa Clara. 
uh, public speakers and things like that, it's going to be streamed. And we've come tremendous way towards making this web open, and we all need to keep making this web open. Part of making the web open is considering people with uh, accessibility needs when you're making your content, and I'd be happy to work with you if you have ideas about how to improve accessibility. would love to hear from you, um, and I'd love to work with you and work on prototypes and get Apple to turn voice over SVG support back on. Uh, and I thank you for your present, for your time. And uh, any questions? Well, uh, despite the initial problems with the screen reader, I thought it's uh, very interesting. Well, that's very generous. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> oh, other questions? You kind of touched on it towards the end about the option to query data that's plotted through SVG, is that something that you're going to try and formalize this in? Yeah, you're going to just basically ask a question of what is... Yeah, so we're trying to abstract the model. So, I mean, if you have, for example, um, if you have a series, a series might be represented as a set of bar, as a particular part of a stack of a, a set of bars, or it might be represented as, a, as one line among many lines. And those things are all related to one another. But then they also, I mean, if you think about it as a table, I mean, if you could represent something as a table, represent it as a table, because that's the best representation of the thing. If you can't represent it as a table, it's not really a table, so don't, <laughs> so don't pretend it's a table. But if I wanted to compare something in a series or in a uh, set, uh, I might want to be able to jump around to different points within that set uh, or different points within that series. Or I might want to sum up all of the parts of a set or a series, right? I want to, might want to sum up all of those things. And if they're all marked as being part of a set or part of a series, then, uh, then you should be able to do that. And that might be as simple as just grouping them in the same thing and saying this is a set or this is a series or whatever, and, how, and, tell, and saying how those correspond to other sets or series. Does that make sense? Um, and, and again, the more discreetly you categorize the data, the more portable your data is, the more that people can pull it out and reuse it, you know, extract it into CSV or whatever. Hi, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, when I test for accessibility using WAVE, from like, the biggest single problem seems to be contrast. Mm. This is what occurs more yeah. and more often. Yeah, if I look at the, the slide that happened up there now as an example of something that I'm sure would fail in contrast. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and whether or not other people find that is the biggest single problem for accessibility than with websites. Um, contrast is a big thing. There are user style sheets. They, 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 there's ways of, there should be, I think there should be more things in, I think there should be a standard way of saying uh, put contrast here. There's a problem with contrast in that for aesthetics, a lot of people don't want to have high contrast. But certain people need it. I actually think that there should be, I don't think you should have to sacrifice your aesthetics for somebody else's specific needs. I think that what sh we should have, and this is just my personal opinion, we should have something, a, a setting in browsers that says, I need high contrast. And then you can provide an alternate style sheet that provides high contrast. Another thing is if we could get the invert keyword on colors, that would be really useful. Uh, uh, Mozilla doesn't support that. That'd be really nice if they did. I also, I think a lot of us uh, are have a greater appreciation for font size uh, problems now than we did when we were uh, five to ten years younger. <laughs> I have a question in the way I manage to information <coughs> and uh, in the project I use, the uh, QGIS project, we have color preview modes for uh, color blindness, uh -huh. so you can easily, uh, in the menu, you can pick up, uh, uh, I think there are two main color blindness Right, right. Modes, and uh, you can easily preview it. 
I think that's I think that's another one of those things that there should be a preference that basically says I I have this color blindness and any of the browser can automatically adjust the colors or a user could uh, or sorry an author could provide a style sheet for uh, different color blindness modes. I, I don't think one size fits all when it comes to the web. Frankly, I think you can try to make things as accessible as possible, but I think that there are certain things, this is my opinion, and I'm not speaking for W3C. I bet some people would hate me saying this, but I think there should be some way of people indicating what their, uh, what their preferences and needs are so that, we can, so that we as developers and designers can actually address those specific concerns rather than try to generalize. Because if you, there's two different color blindness, but there are several different ways of being colorblind, and some of them, you can't satisfy all of them. Some people don't like high contrast because it actually hurts their eyes, it's, it, and, and actually it, it's harmful to them, like physically painful for them to see high contrast. So do I add high contrast for those people who need high contrast and risk making some, make it painful for other people? These are, com these are conflicting things, and I think that we should be able to address them discreetly. It's even useful for us to pick you more to can pick you in gray screen, as it would print out on a black and white printer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and you can pick you in the box mode uh, this way. That's another nice thing about the Brewer palette, actually, that I didn't mention, is that in printing, uh, the Brewer palette is uh, selected so that those colors still, they, they, they downscale to grayscale really nicely. So you can still get, con if you use the Brewer palette, you're still going to get the right kinds of relationships and, and distinctions between your objects. Anything else? You guys have an awesome audience. Thank you. And, and I really am sorry that Apple let you down like that. <laughs>